And so everyone's like, this is a bad idea. The moment you self-publish, you know, you're just locking the doors and no one is going to take you seriously. And I thought that that's fine because no one is taking me seriously anyway. So I wanted to start with a crazy statistic that I read, which was a study that was done in 2015, which said that 6.7% of Americans have only read one poem in the last year. And it just kind of occurred to me that someone reading one of your poems on Instagram could mark mm -hmm. the advent of their first interaction with a yeah. poem, which is kind of amazing and incredible. So congratulations on everything that you've done. and. You are just about to embark on this huge American tour, and how does that, how does that feel? <laughs> it's, it feels amazing, and I'm really grateful, and I feel really blessed. Um, I think it's like always a difficult, it's difficult to answer that question, because for me and my life, poetry's always just been such a consistent part of it. Yeah. And so now everybody's like, oh my God, poetry is like everywhere. It's this crazy thing. And I haven't been able to really see that shift because it's always been around me. But I think it's so important. And I think it's important because poetry allows you to process emotion and it allows you to express it. And it, it's crazy that such a low percentage of people actually use it as a tool to heal and as a tool to share. And so I think it's great that we're in a time now where so many more people are reading and using it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I completely agree. Um, that was really how I felt reading your book, that it was just incredibly Thank healing. You. And also, I loved it as a shorthand for ideas that I found really difficult to express mm -hmm. myself. I yeah. could refer someone to this poem. I could mm -hmm. just send them a screenshot of mm -hmm. something. And um, I felt so lucky to have that as a tool in my arsenal that I mm -hmm. could kind of draw on and be like, this is what it feels like, mm -hmm. you know, here. Um, so that's incredible. You're giving people more words, more language. It's incredible. Thank you. You're a poet in, you know, the day and age of, you post something on your Instagram account and you get instant feedback. So you, you know, most, most writers will yeah. put a book out into the world and maybe they'll read a review or maybe they'll meet someone that's read their work that has an opinion, but you have to come mm -hmm. face to face with people's responses and feelings to your work on yeah. a daily basis in, in drones. And I'm just, I'm curious, does that affect your writing? Does that affect? Yeah. You know, it does, it does two things. The feedback's always reassuring in that, oh, there's people here that want to read this. I'll keep <laughs> writing it. Um, but I'm also very self-aware of the fact that I don't want what other people think to change how I write and what I write about. And I remember very early on, this was probably, Milk and Honey was first self-published and at the end of 2014. And when it came out, all of my friends were like, okay, so we were like taking a look at your Instagram and we realized that the poems about love and heartbreak get the most amount of love. And you know your other pieces about like sexual abuse and all that, okay, yeah. maybe you want to like chill on those because <laughs> mm, there's not that much interaction. And I remember for a month, I was like, you know, you're right. I should be doing everything that I can to get this book into as many hands as possible. But it didn't feel right. And what I felt was this magic there was some sort of magic going away. And I realized it was because writing for me, and I explain it as like a romantic relationship with like a partner. It's, it is a romantic relationship. It's like this spiritual connection that I have. And it's when I feel closest to myself. And you wouldn't let a third party enter your romantic relationship and their opinions shouldn't affect how you feel about the person that you love. So why would I let hundreds and thousands of people and their opinions affect how I write and what I write about. And so I'm very aware of <laughs> really letting that feedback change. Um, so I'm very like, okay, I don't read reviews, uh, but, and I hardly read comments. Um, and that's usually how I do it. I think it's about honesty and just sharing that. Yeah, yeah. that's amazing. That's such a good analogy. And I mean, yeah, I relate, I think, the discipline, the self-discipline it takes mm -hmm. to not allow a third-party opinion into your psyche and your creative space is, is key. Um, 
it's hard when it's, it's about you. It must be really hard. It's so personal. It's so personal. Everybody around me is like, it's okay. Like, you know, this person isn't criticizing you. They're just criticizing the work. And I'm like, but the poetry is literally me. Yeah. <laughs> like, how is it not about me? You yeah. know, this is poems about my life, poems about my experiences and the people that I love. So it's very difficult. And even though I am so self-aware and mm -hmm. I do try to like, you know, not let it affect, affect me, I'm sure that at a level it has affected, you know, the way that I write. Yeah. Um, and yeah. that has for sure, some part of it has gone into like how I've written the second book. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's what's so beautiful. And one of the other things I wanted to talk to you about was how incredibly there's a, there's a lack of self-consciousness there that's so beautiful. There's like an, such an innocence and then like a purity to the way that you did that. And how old were you when you posted the um, now really famous picture of you um, mm. With menstrual blood I on a sheet. I think I was 22 or 23. See, that's amazing to me because I remember, I mean, I, I had I had more confidence at that age, but oh, I me still, too. yeah, but I still, um, I like, I wonder, I was just, it was so fearless. It was mm -hmm. so brave. And I'm, I had no idea what, I, like, I agree with you. I was so much more confident and so much more raw and I just didn't care about anyone and anything. And I was like, I'm gonna do what I want, how I wanna do it. And it was a good thing, <laughs> but it allowed me to get into some trouble with that photograph. And, you know, I was very naive about the internet because I'd written about periods before. Uh, there's a poem about them in Milk and Honey. Mm. And so I thought that this photograph wouldn't be a big deal. It was a part of a school project and, you know, the class loved it and it was going well. And so I thought, it's fine. Like, my readers know that this is how I feel about this topic. Yeah. And initially, though, my readers were like they embraced it. Like the initial response was like, oh my God, like we love this, this is amazing. But when it got out of those circles and when it went into other circles, that's when the trouble sort of came. And I feel like <laughs> the experience brought this anxiety of people having so much access. Because mm. I remember thousands and thousands and thousands of comments coming in by the hour and figuring out at a young age how to manage that. And I think that really took that naivety away. And now I'm a lot more careful. And there's, I wouldn't call it self-censorship, but mm -hmm. I think that the more that you grow and the more that you realize that this is how many people have access to this, the more that you think, am I ready to share this or not? Yeah. 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 Um, your caption, your response to that, the patriarchy is leaking, was just, was so brilliant. And Thank you. I, I don't think women, it occurs to women how much they're being censored yeah. and how much being a woman is, sen is censored. Exactly. I had the worst dinner with a friend the night before last and the words came out of her mouth, you don't realize how much the world hates women until you are breastfeeding. And I'm like, that is just, wow. no one should ever say that. Those yeah. are words that should never come out of a woman's mouth. I agree. Um, and it made me so sad. But I, I, until you're, until it's out there or you, you engage in some way, and as you say, you stumble on, well, I posted this picture and actually yeah. I realized it was a huge deal. Yeah. It even, actually wasn't okay. Exactly. And, even the patriarchy is leaking. Like, I feel like I didn't even write those words because it was in the heat of the moment mm -hmm. when those photos were taken down and me realizing, like I realized in that moment how much censorship there is of women because I had so many groups of women popping up around me that were like, no, 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 you don't understand how wrong this is because you have all of these other accounts that are able to post like pornography and all these images and all this media that actually objectifies us. And so you need to really do something about it. And I remember in the heat and the passion of that moment, I was like, the patriarchy is leaking. Yes. It's so good. It's yeah. so good. It's so good. Um, you self-published. I did. Your, your work was originally rejected, mm -hmm. which is crazy, as so many great writers' work is uh, at the very beginning. Tell me, what, what does that mean for a writer to be self-published? What is that? I think traditionally it's not a very good thing. <laughs> um, it's kind of saying that, hey, and that's what my professors were, like I, the first thing I did was go to my professors and say, hey, you know, I write poetry and I think I want to publish a book because my readers are asking for it. So what should I do? And I didn't know anyone. I 
was a student, I was in so much debt, and so I wasn't going to spend an exorbitant amount of money getting it sent anywhere. And my professor said, you know, try magazines, try literary journals and anthologies, and everybody faces a lot of rejection before they get there, so it's fine, let's keep going. And so I took her advice, I took this book, and I started to strip it, and I grouped together pieces of like five poems, three poems, seven poems, and I started to send them out. And it just wasn't working. And I kind of understood why, because these anthologies and these journals were about like Canada and the literary landscape, and like Canada's where I'm from, and so it was a very specific sort of like themed pieces, and how was poems about like body hair and sexual abuse really gonna fit into all of that? And I self-published the day that I realized that my poetry is, for me, Milk and Honey is one large poem. It's one continuous poem from the front to the back. And I was cheating, wow. you know, like it's like a body of work, but what I was doing was like taking eyelashes and fingertips and limbs and just throwing them and trying to make it work. Um, when really I had to take the responsibility of putting the whole thing together and then being like, here it is. And so everyone's like, this is a bad idea. The moment you self-publish, you know, you're just locking the doors and no one is going to take you seriously. And I thought that that's fine because no one is taking me seriously anyway. <laughs> I don't even know these people that aren't, aren't even going to like me. So yeah. who cares? And so then I did that. And although at the moment everybody told me it was the worst decision I could have made, it's turned out to be the best. And I think it, timing is one thing. It's, I did it at a time when the internet was really changing the face of publishing. And yeah. so it was just the perfect circumstance, circumstances coming together. Yeah. 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 That's amazing. It's, a, it's such a great story. It's so inspiring. And now you have 2.8 million followers or I do. something crazy. <laughs> yeah. which is, you must wake up in the morning and go, wow. You know, yeah. yeah. I don't believe it's real. <laughs> I, I'm 100%. I'm like, there is somebody out there buying these followers for me. <laughs> and it's also to, while I'm asleep. You know? Followers. Yeah. And it's hard to grasp the... It's just pixels on the screen. Mm. So it comes to life only when it's real life. And yeah. like two people are sitting together, we're hugging and we're actually having a conversation. That's yeah. when I'm like, it takes my oh, breath away. Real. Yeah, yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. How this work has been received uh, in India, in, mm -hmm. your, in your home country, versus how it's been received. Because, you know, what is mad to me is that your work is considered radical for Western culture. Mm -hmm. So what blows me away yeah. is... It's crazy that it's radical. Yeah. I don't feel like it's even remotely radical. Yeah. Every day I wake up, I'm like, I need to get some edge. Like, yeah. let's, let's do this. <laughs> but, you know, but, I mean, it's crazy, but it, it is. Well, I guess you've already answered the question in yeah. a way. Did you realize what you were doing was going to be so no. disruptive, radical, transgressive? Did you talk to your parents before you started writing poems like these oh and putting God. them out? Did you, I mean, were there conversations? None. Did you, none. No. Wow. It was, well, the only really conversations I ever had, so I started performing, like doing spoken word and going to like poetry slams and open mics about nine years ago. And my parents had no understanding of what that meant. And they were very, like I have immigrant parents and my mom, stays at home with the kids. I have three younger siblings and my dad is a truck driver. So he's like, listen, girl, you need to study 28 hours in the day, eight days a week. I don't know. You're going to make it happen and you're going to become a doctor, a lawyer or something because you will not like work your body to the bone like I had to. And so when I would ask them, hey, like drop me off to this thing, I'm going to be performing in my dad's mind. He's like, what does that even mean? And no, you're not going there. And so because I got such a negative response from them early on, I didn't tell them that I was sharing my work online or I didn't even tell them I was going to self-publish. And I, and I used to have nightmares um, when I first started to share my work online that there was pieces that are about like sexuality and exploring that. And that's not something that we talk about at home. Mm. So I would have nightmares that somebody, like some ex-boyfriend, is going to print this stuff out <laughs> and just hand it over to them. And luckily that never happened. But I remember that when the book came out, I went home and I was like, I have to tell them. And so I kind of dropped it off. My dad was having breakfast and I was like, here it is. And... 
since that day, everything shifted. It was like in that second, it was a complete 180. And he went from being like, no, you're not doing this weird poetry mic thing. It's a waste of time to being like, oh, this is a book. I understand this. And how can we help you push it forward? Wow. Yeah, yeah. My mom still thinks that the sexual pieces are a little bit too much. <laughs> and she'll be like, to my sister, she'll be like, you know, I'm really happy that I can't really understand everything that you're saying. <laughs> it's a little bit, but they support me. And I feel very lucky because I know that a lot of other parents coming from the community that I come from wouldn't push their daughter to do what I do. So I feel very blessed to have them. Yeah, yeah. that's amazing. And um, what do you think, uh, what do you think gave you the strength, the resilience, the fearlessness? What kind of inspired that in you? I think my dad, which is so really? ironic, because he's yeah. the same guy that was like, stop, stop, stop. But I mean, he was a, he's a refugee. And so I hear about the things that he went through back home in India and what he had to do to save his life. And I remember being, I came over as an immigrant when I was three and a half. Um, but I remember being five years old, seven years old, and being at protests, like all over downtown Toronto. And I had no idea what I was saying, but my dad was like, listen, this is what's going on. There's like things called genocides and there's things called this, and we're just gonna go up there and wow. we're gonna like, and I was like, what are we doing? And just like this little old me, wow. you know? And I think that sort of spirit really, really, empowered me and then when I grew up and I was a part of like local activist groups and youth groups he was like no 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 like don't don't do this he's like this is what got me into trouble why are you doing this and I used to laugh because I'm like I'm your daughter can't have it both ways yeah exactly but I think if you describe it as like this fearless fearlessness yeah. I don't even see it like that because it's just my norm, like seeing your dad and even my mom like deal with things that she had to deal with, it's just a norm in my house. And so I, I owe it to them, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I guess that's what's so, yeah, his existence, his existence made mm. his life political. And exactly. Yeah, that's, that's not a, that's just the day to day. Exactly. Yeah. I really appreciated the poems where you deconstructed your own misogyny, especially mm -hmm. the one about, um, you know, I apologize to any of the women that I said were pretty before I called them intelligent or brave. Mm -hmm. And it really resonated because I've had to do so much unpicking yeah. of my own, of my own stuff. And you've also said that social media is kind of a can be a really difficult place to maintain a healthy sense of self and yeah. self-esteem and I'm curious how you navigate those mm -hmm. those choppy waters and and keep sort of finding this well of of yeah. self-love and um yeah love love for yourself yeah as a woman as you are in a world that doesn't support mm -hmm. that that actually that actively yeah does not support that I think it cycles. I grew up, I don't know, for some reason, like I always felt too much and I thought too much and like very low self-esteem, non-existent, you know? And like I was, like there was a point where my self-esteem was so bad that I would have to shower with the lights off or even brush my teeth with the, light, teeth with the lights off because if I like had to see my face in the morning, I would disgust myself. And to go from that to then being somebody who's working on Milk and Honey and my confidence during that time was amazing. I was like, I'm great, all right, cool. And then I thought that would just stay around forever and I'd always be confident and just feel beautiful and not be down on myself all the time. And then suddenly, I don't know how or why, but then it dropped all over again. And I was like, what, what, what? And I was like, how can I be sharing this message? But yet, waking up every day and criticizing myself. And so like, I realized that self-love is like a consistent thing that you have to work towards and it's always gonna happen in cycles. And so mm. it's just like everyday work, you know? And yeah. you will never have it all figured out yeah. and you just have to be kind to yourself. And someone said to me once, talk to yourself like you would talk to your best friend. And you would never say certain things to your best friend. So why would you say those things to yourself? Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. yeah, cycles is a great way of, of yeah. putting it. 
Because it, yeah, it's so funny. I've had exactly the same experience where I've been feeling great, and then one thing would get said, and mm -hmm. you're like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm still there. Yeah. I'm like there again. You know, it's it's amazing. So, yeah, um, that's beautifully put. Yeah, your uh, your poem about, you know, how we treat ourselves is how we teach others to love us. Was mm -hmm. also a really beautiful. Yeah. Um, was beautiful Thank too. You. I love the purity and the simplicity of your illustrations and your Thank line you. drawings. Where did they, did they come mm -hmm. second? Did they, where did they arrive? They kind of arrived first, way before the poetry. That's amazing. Yeah. I didn't realize that. I was, I've been drawing since the age of five and painting. I remember being five years old. We lived in the city called Hamilton, Southern Ontario. And there was, no other kids around me except my baby sister who was still an infant and did not speak to me at all. <laughs> and so we had a like a senior couple live upstairs and they were also Punjabi and sick and so they would come down and babysit me and I remember that they would bring down like markers and pens and then they would take the jewels off of my mom's like Punjabi suits and we would make elephants and shapes and that's when my love affair with art got started and so I consistently drawing and painting and that's what I wanted to do until I found writing and writing just took my breath away. It was like louder and it was sexier and it just, there was something about it. It was something about the way that my, the mic picked up my voice that was so electrifying. And so I put my art away and I started to publish online. And it wasn't until I realized that I wanna do something a little bit different. I wanna push this poetry a little bit that I opened up my old high school sketchbooks and I realized that, oh, I've been doing this forever. And I, these sketchbooks were filled with line illustrations with like red marker and thank God I let the red marker thing go because that wouldn't have been pretty. <laughs> and it was all like illustrations of women and loss and trauma. And in the top left corner, I would always write a sentence or two or even a couple of words. and. So I thought, okay, why not, you know, I'm, I wasn't going to start becoming talented at something else. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, all right, I'm just going to bring this other thing back. And so I started to do the digital illustrations and 50% of me was like, this is a good idea. And the other 50 was like, this is kind of silly. But that was one of the moments where the feedback from the readers really helped me keep, oh, going. keep going. Yeah. Cause they were like, oh, cool. We love this. Keep making more. And I remember the first night that I made them, it was... December of 2013, I think I made like 10 to 20 illustrations that night. And it's just been like there ever since. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Your work is also performance art as yes. well. You have, you're kind of your own canvas in a mm -hmm. funny way. And, you know, even the way that you speak and gesture and um, the way that you dress, and I know it's been really important for friends of mine that you um, that you have worn traditional clothing on your Instagram mm -hmm. as representation. Mm -hmm. And are you starting to think very carefully? Uh, and is it strange to think about how to curate yourself? It is strange. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I was curious I think about that. My love affair, I've always had a love affair with fashion. Yeah. And I think it comes from the fact that growing up, I had no access to the clothes I wanted to wear. Mm. And my parents, like, they dressed me for years in the clothes we brought from India. And it was, I have photos on photos with boy clothes on. And some of the boys' clothes even said boy on it, you know? Wow. It was like, come on, you know? <laughs> Didn't even wear a single dress growing up. And so I remember there's this one vivid memory where one of my aunts, she was, she worked at like a Sears outlet and she felt really bad that I was always dressed up like a dude. <laughs> and so she bought me these red corduroy pants and they were like on sale. They were probably like seven bucks. I remember she came over and she was like, oh, I brought these for Rupi, like let her try them on. And my parents were like, no, no, no. Like we don't want to, you know? And then they were, she was like, no, no, no. Like she like shoved me into the bathroom and I remember putting them on and there were bell bottoms and they had like flowers embroidered at the bottom and I cried and it was the first time that I felt like a girl. Mm. And that's when I was like, whoa, I love dressing. And um, so it's been important for me since and especially wearing, like for my UK tour that just passed in, I think it was April, I only wore Indian designers. Mm. And 
that was so important because I remember I used to be so embarrassed going from the Gurdwara, which is the Sikh temple, and trying to go to the grocery store. My mom would be like, oh, we're already out. Let's just go do groceries. And I was like, are you kidding me, woman? Like, are yeah. you trying to ruin my life? <laughs> you know, I already look like an alien and now I'm going to dress like one too. And so to go from that to being like, oh, I'm actually going to go out of my way to wear Indian clothes in front of 3,000 people. It's just such a flip. Yeah. It's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's so cool. And I, yeah, I really picked up on like the specificity and that there was like a very careful choice yeah. there. And it's so yeah. beautiful I, and yeah. really, I know, really mm. empowering to so yeah. many women. So yeah. thank you for doing that and thank being you. so conscientious yeah. in your choices. I think it's important. Like there are, growing up, I didn't have many people who look like me doing what I do. Yeah. And I have that platform. And so it is political. It. And it's funny because you do like, you doing that in the position that you are, it, like gives, it gives permission yes. in a strange way and yeah. it makes it okay. And, and in the same way that you're talking about the topics you're talking about, mm -hmm. you gave me more permission to oh. talk more about you gave me things. more permission to talk about <laughs> like feminism and all of these things. I remember like when you said that word, the weight of the world kind of left my body and it's like, I don't know if you think it's a big deal, but it's a big deal for us, you know? And I remember when I first heard that word, I didn't think it was a bad word because anything with the word feminine in it, anything about women is so beautiful. And I'm like, I want to represent that and I want to know what this is about. And I remember grade 10 English class, the teacher was like, how many of you are feminists? And I said, me. And I looked around and nobody else had their hand mm -hmm. up and I was like, oh, never mind. And I was like, I never want to go there again. And it's so important. It's so important. Yeah. Oh, that makes me happy. Yeah. It's so beautiful to hear you even say, because I've spent a lot of time, especially because trying to have men understand that mm -hmm. male feminists are a thing yeah. and almost apologetically going, well, I know there's the word feminine in it, but it still includes you and yeah. da, 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 da. And it's, it's beautiful just to hear yeah. you say like, even anything with that word in it, you know, it's, you want to embrace yeah. even in the even the mention of it or, or trying to make it inclusive, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I find myself apologizing oh, a little too. bit. And it's like, what am I doing? No. Yeah. Like you know? I have friends who are like, oh, this guy that I know, he really likes your work. He doesn't like feminists. He thinks they're super annoying, but he likes you. And I'm like, not a compliment that I want, but thank you. Yeah. And also if he likes the work, then there's, yes, anyway, exactly. we, we don't even have to go down that yeah, road. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> I'm curious what artists inspire you and that you mm -hmm. admire and why. And yeah, there's so many. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's a, it's a huge question. No, it's okay. Yeah. Let me give you some. I really like Sharon Olds. I don't know if you've ever read her no. poetry. I will send you some, it's amazing. And her poem, she writes about what it's like to be a woman and she, it makes you feel your womanhood in your entire body. Oh. So amazing and so beautiful. And there is a painter by the name of Amrita Shergil, and she's a Punjabi Hungarian woman. And she inspires me because she painted photos of us. And just to see those paintings now selling for millions of dollars, I'm like, this is insane. So, um, so people like that, Malala, inspires me. Amal Clooney inspires me every day. I have the, she was on Vogue magazine, the cover recently. Yep, I bought it right too. Right in front, yeah. It's on my desk where I write every day because like yep. that represents to me that, oh, I can be intelligent, I can be beautiful, I can be every single thing, I can be multidimensional and it's allowed. And yeah. she gives me, her being on that cover gives me permission to be everything. Yeah. I agree with you. That was really huge for me mm -hmm. too. I, she's someone I think about. Yeah. Um, that's very, very cool. Music. Do you yes. love music? What, what do you I listen do. to at the moment? I listen to, um, hold on, I'm like shuffling through all of the inappropriate things. <laughs> You're like, <laughs> mm, oh. yeah. I have to do the same thing. Uh, <laughs> I get it. I listen to everything. There's not really a specific style that I vibe with only. Um, recently, I mean, I also have my like writing music. Yeah. So when I am writing, I oh. can only listen to instrumental. If there's words in it, I, oh, I don't know. Too much. It's too much. And I'm like, I need to project myself onto this rather than this thing projecting onto me. <laughs> um, but to get into the mood and the emotion of writing, I listen to like Punjabi folk music. Mm. And I listen to the music that was like 
you know when they say that there's like certain albums that stay with you and it's like there's a certain time period from like the yeah. ages of like 15 to like 21 and those are the albums you never forget. Yes. I have to listen to those on repeat. So I, I'm i listening to like Frank Ocean. Yeah. There's like a one Adele album that I have to like play all of the time. Um, Beyonce self-titled album and even Lauryn Hill. Um, yeah. You know, they really bring me back to that place where I was while writing about the really difficult topics. So mm -hmm. I listened to those to get into the mood and then I put on like my Kualis and my like Eastern music and then eventually I go to like the instrumental and that's when I get to work. Oh, amazing. Yeah. You're obviously drawing from a particular period of your life and that's where you're writing from, but has the experience of fame and everything that has come from what the yeah. original work inspired, do you think that that's taken you on even more of a journey and you might draw from that? Ah, uh, I think I should. I think it's a really weird experience and I don't, <laughs> no one really asked me that question and I never talk about it because I'm like, nobody wants to hear me complain about that. But it's a weird, unnatural juxtaposition in your body. Um, and I haven't figured it out yet, but I know that I need to write about it. Um, but it was difficult to go from, you know, being 19, 18, and 21 and writing about the topics I wrote about in Milk and Honey and then suddenly this beautiful thing that the universe gave me, it took me to a place of stability yeah. and safety and then I was like, I should have been happy, but instead I was very confused because I, stability and safety were not the norm that I grew up in and they were not ever around. And suddenly I had to write from a place of that and I couldn't write. And I had to teach myself to write from that place. And I still haven't fully figured it out yet, but it's like years in the making, you know? For like two decades, I was writing from a place of fear. Mm. Um, and now to be writing from a place of power. I'm still mm. learning how to figure that out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a huge journey. It's interesting. So I wanna, I wanna make sure that I ask you some questions from my book club readers okay. who loved your book <laughs> and- They're so sweet. Yeah? They are just so delightful oh, with the photos so and the messages they've been sending me. So oh, thank you to all of them oh, that for reading happy. the book, yeah. Yeah, there was, you'll see there are some beautiful questions and people really, really loved, really loved the book. So this is from Viviana. Uh, Rupi, I wanted to say how beautiful your writing is. I wanted to ask, where do you enjoy writing? Is something, is this something you prefer to do in private, mm. in a coffee shop, in a park? Mm. Uh, do you write by hand or do you write you know, with okay. your computer? So I've tried all of those things. Yeah. Writing in a park is too messy. I get dirt all over my clothes. It's just not a good look. Writing in a coffee shop is too loud. I have yet to find a very quiet coffee shop. I like to write in my bed or on the couch. And I think it's because it feels casual. Yes. You know, yeah. versus like this big oak desk and me trying to be like, all right, I'm a writer and I'm going to write something brilliant today. Um, so it's usually in one of those two places where it's quiet, really, mm. and a space that's empty, not cluttered. Um, and I write both by hand and on the computer. So every day I have the practice of writing by hand and it's a lot of free writing. Mm. There's no intention behind, you know, what this is going to look like. Um, but it's trying to keep that writing muscle active because writing is a muscle and you have to continue to work it out if you want it to stay strong. And there was a time when I stopped writing for a year and I lost it all. Um, but then, yeah. And then I take the pieces that I like from that, from my journals, I transfer those to my laptop and that's when I begin editing. But then what happens is that there are pieces you wake up one morning and you already feel it in your body and it's already finished and it's almost like playing like a song in your head and there's no time for no notebooks or pencils and you run to your laptop and you're like, just got to get it out. Yeah. So I think you just have to like, you have to go with what works for you. And mm -hmm. I've read so much on like what other writers and authors do and what advice works for them, but you have to, you have to do what's right for you and what feels right. Yeah. Lastly, what advice would you give to a writer who is afraid of writing and is holding back? Uh, I think you, I get it. I feel that every day and I've published two books and every day I'm afraid and I'm like, this is too much or I'm not good enough. I say to the people around me and my team, I'm like, I think that's it. I think it's done now. Everybody pack your bags, let's go home. 
And so I can really relate to that. And the reason I say that is because I think it's so important for creative people to know that they're not alone. Creativity and being an artist is just kind of an isolating experience. And mm. so to know you're not alone helps and you have to let the fear go. And you have to write not for the product, mm. but just for the simple act of writing. And you just gotta write, 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 write. And I always say, hey, I'm gonna go away for three months. I'm just gonna write really bad things. Yeah. It's gonna be like garbage. Yeah. And that's fine. And I have mm. to get it out of the way before I can get to the good stuff. And so write the bad stuff that just makes you like closer to the good stuff and hone in on your craft. And I think practice really makes perfect. Wow, so it's yeah. really about letting go of an outcome yeah. in a way. And I think fear is so debilitating for creative people because it allows, it's like tying your hands up behind your back and nothing gets done in that mm. way. So you just got to let it go. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. Question from OSS member India. How much editing does a poem typically go through before you're comfortable sharing it? Are they pretty raw or do you spend time after the first inspiration tweaking them? Mm. I think it depends on the piece. Like I said, that there's that feeling you get in your belly and it's like this kick or it turns a little bit, it's like butterflies. And when you get that, you know that the poem is done. So sometimes I can write like a four minute poem mm. in two hours and it requires very little editing. But then there are some pieces like Women of Color is 10 words. I spent probably a year fixing it. It used to be a love poem. Wow. And it became Women of Color and so, you just can't stop until your gut says it's done. Yeah, yeah. No rights. I read Milk and Honey last summer, the month of my sexual assault. Mm. And as a trans boy who at the time was 15 years old, felt so alone, Milk and Honey really inspired me to seek help. Thank you so much for being the light I needed to get help, Rupi. My question for you is, what was the hardest thing about writing the book? Mm -hmm. What was going through your mind while you were writing it? Much love. The hardest thing about writing the book Milk and Honey wasn't hard to write because I wasn't writing Milk and Honey. I was just writing because I loved it so much and it's this thing that took over my body and it was kind of like, almost like I was addicted to writing at that time. I would steal away any moment. I was in university and my friends were out partying and I was like, all right, hold on, just one more line, you know? <laughs> wow. And it was just this love affair that I had and it wasn't until really the collection was done that my readers asked me for a book. I never, ever imagined, I was I'm a huge book lover growing up and I've read like hundreds of books but never thought it could be me. But when they said, hey, where can I purchase your book? That's when I was like, oh, okay, I guess I can do something with this and everything was already done. So it was very easy to like put it all together. But the pressure I felt actually during the second book and I think cause there's like this intention of, I'm gonna like go on this journey and write a book. And so I think you just have to take it easy and take it one day at a time and it doesn't have to become this whole giant confusing thing. And I just take it one page at a time. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Um, one from Devin. Reading about the tensions between you and your father was heartbreaking for me because I always felt very close to my own dad. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't like imagining it any other way for us. My question is, did this book impact your current relationship with your father in any way? It definitely did. We are, my dad is, <laughs> he's gonna watch this and completely hate me, I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> why? You need to tell me these things before you say them. Um, he is very sensitive and he's very emotional, but you could never see that because he has this exterior that is so rough and it's so tough and he doesn't know how to communicate emotionally, verbally, anyway. And so he was always this scary figure in my life. Um, but the books really brought us together because it's something that we can like connect through. And I think it allowed him to see that I'm not a little girl, you know? And he doesn't, he just, he can relax a little bit. And he sees that I'm this young woman now who has her life figured out, not entirely of course, but like is on the road to figuring things out and I can make good decisions and it's okay. And even to like, I brought him on the India tour with me oh, and it is, it's the most time we've ever spent together and wow. it's the most talking we've ever done in our life. Wow. And so it was really, really emotional. There were many days where I was crying on planes and in hotel rooms because I'm like, I can't believe this is happening. And I was able to see my father as a man and not my father for the first time. And 
it was bittersweet because it was like amazing that that was happening, but I was like, wow, it took 25 years to get here, that's a long time. And so it's definitely helped a lot. And, you know, we talk about art and poetry all of the time now. So it's nice. Oh, yeah. that's great. <laughs> that's awesome. Colette has a question. What has been the most impactful experience for you since Milk and Honey was published? I think just meeting people who read the work and connect with it so much, because people always ask, they're like, oh my God, how does it feel? Like you're going to all these places and doing all these things. You must like wake up just being overjoyed every day. And I'm like, not really. I mean, I'm, it's good. It's amazing. It's normal, yeah. but I'm not like, this is crazy. Cause it's just maybe because I'm on this train and it's going super fast and none of it feels real. That's the problem. I feel like it's all happening to like my twin sister. And she just like never shows up, so I have to show up for her and do the talking for her. Mm. Um, but then I meet people and they're like, I love your work and this is what it did for me. And those are the moments where like all the emotions come out and I'm like, oh my God, this is important and I have to keep going. Yeah. Awesome. Unicorn wants to know, <laughs> did you get any backlash or hate from your community because of writing about these issues? Mm -hmm. And if so, how do you deal with it? I myself yeah. am an aspiring novelist and poet, and the only thing holding me back from publishing is my fear from my conservative community. Yeah, I get that. I think the, I was so, I remember a month before Milk and Honey was self-published, I couldn't sleep anymore. It was like consistent anxiety of like, what is gonna happen to me and what are people gonna think? <sighs> uh, I, there's no answer that's gonna be good enough. But you just have to ignore it because what you're doing is so much stronger than that small group of people who are saying that you're too loud, it's unattractive, and it's not sexy, and you kind of, you know, like yeah. you just have to ignore it. I remember I used to perform about, a lot of my early work was about abuse and violence that's inflicted on women's bodies. And I was this little, like, 17-year-old, and every event that I went to, it's all I talked about, and people would roll their eyes at me, and they'd be like, oh, God. She makes everyone so uncomfortable. And I felt so unattractive. And, but I was like, no, like I cannot, I have to tell the story. If you silence me, like you silence so many other people, then who's gonna tell it? And so you just have to tell it because there's so much empty space that needs to be filled with stories like these. That's beautiful the way you talk about um, how, by giving yourself permission, you give other people permission mm -hmm. to show up with mm -hmm. their vulnerability, with whatever it is that they're carrying, whatever yeah. their story is. And that's that you feel that sense of responsibility, not just to yourself, but to other people and mm -hmm. to other women. That's yeah. amazing. I hear that you are working on short stories, screenplays, and songs. Um, <laughs> do you compose music? Do you play an instrument? Uh, can you share anything that you're working on right now? I'm working on a play. I wouldn't even say songs because uh, I think I'm so terrible at it and no one should ever have to hear me sing. That would just be a <laughs> crime. Um, I used to sing though, like I sang uh, and I did, I played the harmonium for like eight years. I'm sure you sing No, I, I have an instinct no. so that you really <laughs> sing beautifully. People keep saying that and I'm like, ah, it's because there's such a musicality to the way that you speak. Mm. So I feel That's what they say. it would be hard so now I'm working on a something, okay. but I don't call them songs because it is, they've said the same thing. They're like, but it's the way that you sort of move and how the words sort of like leave your mouth and the rhythm of it, that this would be so amazing if it was something mm. like audio. So I'm working on something related to that. I'm more excited about the play because it's coming together really quickly. It's, I perform, I've performed so many shows, but I've never seen my work because I'm the one putting it on, right? but I was in New York for about a week in New York Stage and Film. It's like this little workshop that I did for a week and to put these poems in the mouths of other people and then be in the audience was so electrifying. Wow. And so that's what I'm working on. I've written like chapters of what might be a collection of short stories or maybe fiction or maybe even a memoir, but it's a different part of your head that you have to use when you're writing like longer prose versus the poetry. Mm. And so I think I'll have like a, one more collection of poetry in me before I move into longer prose, yeah. Um, and I, one more question I think I meant to ask earlier actually is, I'm curious, do you ever have men read Milk and Honey and, uh, and it's interesting because it was actually a man that gave me Milk and Honey to read because he loved it so much, but I'm curious whether, that, whether it does 
receive a reception occasionally where they it makes them feel defensive, mm. like having read it. Is that something that you've experienced or come across? Um, I haven't come across it firsthand, mm. but I know it's there mm. because of like the negative criticism. A lot of it does come from guys. And so no one has come up to me and said, I read it and it sucked and I hate you. Yeah. But I mean, <laughs> I expected that mm. and so I would get so much anxiety when I had to do book signings and a man would walk up to me I was like Ooh. my body would tighten and I'm like here I go okay I have to like defend this thing and then suddenly they would say lovely things and I was so confused by it <laughs> and so I think yeah. it's I think it's good I'm like lucky that a lot of men have actually and I think men, like people were writing articles like very early on saying that this is a book that every woman needs to read and like that drove me nuts I on know. Amazon. It's like stored under like women's fiction or women's poetry yeah. or whatever. And I'm like, no, it's like preaching to the choir. Yes. If only women read it. Yes, yes. Like, that's exactly how yeah. I felt. I was yeah. like, please don't file it under that. Yeah, it's, that's not what it is. Exactly. Is... And I'm like, if we're not changing minds and in this then what conversation has to be with men, then what's the point? And so. What was amazing though was like a lot of men in India came out as compared to North America. Like a majority of the audience was guys and I was like this is so cool and I had my own like very messed up ideas of what that audience was going to look like so right. they surprised me entirely. Yeah. Wow. So there is like they're embracing it and a lot of older gentlemen who are like in their 40s and 50s Amazing. Yeah, yeah. So cool. Uh -huh. Amazing. So on behalf of Ash Shelf, thank you so much, Ruby. Um, this has been amazing. And thank before you. I let you go, I'm really curious if you could pick a book for Ash Shelf, what would you recommend? Okay. This was really hard to pick. Um, let's see. Ah, uh, I would say I love, love, love Odes by Sharon Olds. And if you haven't read her, you have to read her. I haven't, her. so. It's amazing. It's just a series of poems that are odes to different things that women have to deal with. Okay, um, and then there's The Color Purple by Alice Walker, which I feel like I read every I chose that as like five, my second or third years. book for the club. Oh, I already? I love that okay. book. Yes, great choice. So good. Great choice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, we have that as one of our picks. So I'm, I'm glad we're on track. Yeah. Um, but Odes, I will definitely yeah. go and find. Thank Please you so do. much for that. Thank you for having me. No, this has been great. I'm so happy I got to meet you in person. Me too. <laughs>